thank you all for joining us uh, for the Professor Rajni Prasanna Endowment Lecture Series. I'd like to hand over the start of the program to Dr. Asha Kamath, our Associate Director of Prasanna School of Public Health. Thank you. Thank you, Rahul. Uh, good evening to all from Prasanna School of Public Health. We are really excited to welcome you all to this fourth virtual lecture under the Professor Rajani Prasanna Endowment Lecture Series on Climate Change and its Impact on Public Health. Before we begin, we wish to wholeheartedly thank Professor Rajani Prasanna for considering us for the endowment, enabling us to connect with eminent researchers from across the globe in order that you know we can have the, uh, interactions for uh, impacts of climate change on various facets of public health. We are grateful to our chief patron, Sri D.A. Prasanna, for steering us towards new endeavors in order that the school achieves aspirations which have been laid in the formulation of it. We would like to thank the whole of the Mahe leadership for all the support that we constantly receive from them. And this virtual meeting this evening is all about a deep exploration to understand the concepts of climate change in a world of changing realities and plan for the challenges ahead in the road of public health. So with this introduction to the lecture series, I'll just hand over to Dr. Rao. Thank you. Rasha Kamatpan, uh, over to you, Dhanushree. Thank you so much for being the moderator. The topic of the seminar today as part of the Professor Rajni Prasanna Endowment Lecture Series is Inhabiting an Equus World, Design Research for the Environment and Communities. Uh, and we are very happy to uh, and very privileged to have Dr. S uh, Deepta Satish uh, to be speaking with us on this topic, who has done a lot of field work in various parts of Western Ghats, trying to understand different dimensions of uh, socio-ecological um, uh, connections, practices, and various ways in which we can understand how climate change really plays out on the ground, uh, you know, amongst uh, the, uh, the socio-ecological landscape itself. Uh, so without uh, without uh, uh, wasting much time, let me first introduce Deepta and then I will hand over the screen to her so that she can present her research and also talk about its implications. Uh, and then we will have a short discussion uh, and uh, uh, question answer session afterwards. So Dr. Deepta Satish is a design researcher, educator, architect and planner working in landscapes uh, in conflict. Her environmental practice is focused on creating new pathways in design, education, and policy. Her doctoral research in the Western Ghats of India gathers uh, situated practices, movement, and the politics of the colonial eye and draws from design, environmental humanities, and philosophy. She is also a dancer, equestrian, cellist, wanderer, and photographer. She is director and founder of Order Research Center and Dean of Research and Collaborations at the Srishti Manipal Institute of Art, Design and Technology, Manipal Academy of Higher Education. The research and uh, projects at Ode Research Center are concerned with the environment and its inhabitants oriented uh, towards revealing and generating new possibilities and frameworks for nature culture uh, synchronicities. The center's work is framed by wet ontologies and is focused on design of environmental policies that are inclusive emergence of participative eco pedagogies and framing of responsive adaptive everyday practices. Uh, Deepta is also a member of the Coastal and Marine Research Group Royal uh, Geographic Society, member of the Consortium of Environmental Philosophers, member of IUCN Commission on Education and Communication, senior advisor at the Forum for Law, Environment, Development and Governance. And she's also the co-editor of the book Product Service System Design for Sustainability, which is a collaboration of the EU Asia Link program learning network on sustainability. So as you can see, she has such a wide experience working in this in this field, particularly also relating to water, which is such an important area for uh, Prasanna School of Public Health as well, because this is something that has very deep connections with public health. Uh, so now I would like to uh, pass over the screen to, uh, to Deepta and so that she can present her research and enlighten us further about her, about her uh, uh, area itself. Yeah, over to you Deepta. 
So today I share with you an inherited past, a con conflicted present, and the possibilities for futures by inviting all of you to dwell in the realities of soaking ecologies through an investigation in the southwestern Ghats and west coast of India. This is a wet, humid, misty, rainy, and boggy world. It is a world dominated by wetness, movement of materials, and inhabitants. I focus on the significance of the role art and design has played in constructing not just the dominant representations of places in the Ghats, but has also created conflicts between the outsider and inhabitant, nature and culture, and atmosphere and earth. This region has, over the past 250 years, been territorialized through an act of colonial power that either settled or marginalized particular people, practices, ecologies, and in particular, the weather, privileging a wet, dry binary and fixing and spatializing a mobile world. To me, at the intersection of climate change and public health lies the concern for the way we conceive and perceive water. In reality, we experience life in inescapable wateriness, a gradient of events such as rain, mist, and conditions of wetness, waters being in plants, soils, in our bodies, and atmosphere. But we learn about the, an image of water as something that is separate from land and atmosphere, and then color it blue. This separation is imagined through a colonial lens, stilling space and regularizing time. Wetness or wet ontologies is a ubiquitous condition of our world, and in particular the southwestern Ghats of India, with waters seeping, oozing, soaking, evaporating, precipitating, transforming. This ontology of inhabiting an aqueous world privileges everyday practices across time that continually makes this terrain in rain and with wetness, such as growing food and making shelters. The inherited colonial framework gives no voice to this wetness excluding indigenous communities and local inhabitants' understandings from dominant narratives and knowledge systems, and is subsequently left out of planning and development, laws and policies. After separating water from land, we build roads, industries, high-density housing. We design permanent infrastructures to manage and control water, like dams, levees, drains, and such. The separation of culture from nature has a direct impact on the health of the environment and its human and more than human inhabitants. Interestingly, local and indigenous practices are rooted in a particular understanding of this dynamic shifting ecological world and processes of the ongoing reappropriation of terrains and materials that constitute them across time appropriated for dwelling in a terrain that requires continual care for sustaining the health of ecologies and inhabitants. Engaging in the Ghats requires a different imagination through everyday ordinary practices and is temporal and more complex than the rationality of the dominant imagination that has designed landscapes only for production and protection. This other imagination of inhabiting an aqueous world privileges wetness as an ordinary normal condition of the world experienced on foot. During the past few years, the Ghats and other regions has experienced dramatic overflows of waters and shifting earth, what we term as floods and landslides, along the western coast and mountains. The devastation to the landscape and livelihoods on the 9th of August 2018, when waters from the largest dam in, dams in Kerala, Idki and Idemaliar, were opened for fear of the dams breaking under the pressure of the amount of water that had gathered in the reservoirs, the officials had waited far too long to release water, and rather than a gradual release, had to open multiple sluice gates simultaneously. Madhav Gadgil was on the news, sharing that the devastation was caused by thoughtless construction projects for development and the lack of clearly demarcating ecologically sensitive zones for conservation in the Ghats. Most of the areas that were affected by the events were colonial monoculture plantations of teak forests, tea and coffee plantations, and intensely cultivated vials or bailus throughout Wynard, Kurg, and South and North Kandra. The plains and coast saw waters everywhere, the backwaters and canals gushing, while many of the locals near the coast took to their houseboats during this time of inundation. Many slopes of the Ghats had been washed away in these places. Roads were torn and washed away along with buildings and expansive low-lying cultivation areas inundated. These floods and landslides have been largely attributed to climate change, 
of when, where, and how much rain has fallen, that a certain amount of rain that had fallen on those few days was more than usual in a particular geography close to the dams, termed as natural disaster, highlighting rain as the culprit. However, the floods and landslides of 2018 and 19, and more recently, are not necessarily markers of only increased rainfall. Following Gardgill's clues, perhaps we can also attribute it to the way humans have attempted to control and manage land and water as separate from each other, a misunderstanding and misrepresentation of the Ghats, to which I add a lack of adequate understanding of the weather, the way the earth transforms with it, and the abilities of the inhabitants to respond to this dynamism. It is not possible to predict exactly where, when, and how much rain will precipitate. And when it does, it becomes water that gets soaked into muddiness, mist, and wet materials, transforming them, moving through them, into the depths of atmosphere and earth. In the current discourse around climate change is the Anthropocene, a geological time that attributes blame on humankind of intensified and extractive human activities interrupting natural processes of ecologies and planet. Perhaps humans are the culprit. In this scenario, these are not natural disasters, they are design disasters that are failures of fixing space and regularizing time. I think we can all agree that still water becomes stagnant and therefore is unhealthy. What is desired is activity and movement in and off waters and wateriness for the element or medium's own health. After the floods of 2018, the inhabitants of the affected areas experienced many health issues, including skin, respiratory, and bacterial infections from churned materials and stagnating pools. The Idiki and Edemaliar dams, like all other dams in the Western Ghats, are built for power generation and need expansive reservoirs of water to be held for months, fed by redirected streams and rivers, channels, and pipes, making other places parched dry. They demand permanent infrastructures privileging land and take up a fixed area, hoarding waters that a multitude of inhabitants, human and non-human, used to depend on for drinking, cleaning, and other daily practices, which they now no, have no access to. These waters are redirected to serve cities in the distance with electricity. What we need to consider is that the Ghats and beyond, the monsoon season is a time of great change and renewal revitalization, initiation, growth and decay, and movement of water, materials, and atmosphere, and the emergence of new things and processes and practices. However, we design the environment to become a habitat for humans by imagining and drawing lines on paper. But these are primarily ways to abstract space and freeze time, stilling the world in a moment convenient to draw plans, section, maps, accounts, calendars, all universally regularizing and making predictable this dynamic environment of the gods that they deem that we deem true representations of the world of the past and the world of the future. To think about this other world, I open up the possibility of two conceptualizations, one of a drainage imagination, which is about a wet, dry separation that the colonizers introduced, and the other is of a is of a threshold imagination, which is a world of seepage and soaking, releasing moisture and holding moisture, transforming over time, becoming conditions of wetness from least wet to most wet. The two worlds that clash in the Ghats are between the voyeur and the walker. The voyeur or the colonial administrator, surveyor, scientist is one who gazes, analyzes, freezes or arrests the world in space and time through the visual, using only a single sense devoid of a sensibility of being in the world. The voyeur writes in order to read or reads in order to write to represent the world in a way that can capture, record, or interpret and represent in order to manage, strategize, and assert power and control. As one moves the eye from being in the ground up and above the ground, the world appears only as a static image to the eye, with other senses becoming inactive. And from afar, the world moves less as one is unable to see the nuances and changes that occur at a scale of human engagement on the ground. The view from above is advantageous, although it is only a partial reality, a privileged perspective as it hides other aspects of change. This is what James Scott terms as the optics of power. The visualization that has been constructed to separate nature from culture, from outside, from inside, and creates conflicts and violences. In the Ghats, particularly since its UNESCO designation as a World Heritage Site in 2012, 
These conflicts had escalated on the ground, emphasizing the need to reveal a more fundamental source of these clashes. This quasi-scientific lens is one of a world that is wholly knowable, stable, and predictable, one of which we draw lines to organize and transmit and manage and control materials that we call resources. However, there are things of the world for which these kinds of lines cannot be drawn, such as other sentient beings, birds and animals, water, material movements, and conditions of wetness that shapeshift multiple grounds for dwelling in this monsoon terrain. There is a world outside of the colonial eye, an imagination that exists in the everyday contemporary that has not been engaged with in thinking about new futures. Being in the world is being in the ground with all senses and sensibilities actively making the world an immersion into context and to be context sensitive. But when seeing from above, there are no sensations but vision. This is the world that is familiar to us from our formal education system and the disciplines that are separated from one another. The conflicts are at a fundamental level of an in inadequate understanding of the complexities of the environment and the weather and its ordinary practices. When we inhabit a threshold imagination by walking, how can we do, how can we see as a local in a rain terrain? The architect, planner, scientist, engineer must shed their view from above that we take for granted to be real and true and see what is here and now on the ground in the environment through wetness and what is changing. I speculate and experiment with these notions in an attempt to develop them as practical frames towards new futures of nature culture synchronicities. So we engage with the seemingly unknown to speculate the diverse possibilities by entering the world of the walker. Here, I share my own experiences and understandings from walking with inhabitants of the Ghats, in particular in Vailnad. What is distinct about farming families in this region is their understanding of different kinds of precipitation and rain and how to correspond and adapt with them, each initiating diverse practices of not just cultivating in the earth, but growing foods such as pepper and vanilla that require particular conditions of atmosphere and tree trunks of moisture and humidity to manifest. These conditions are brought on by seasonal changes in weather experienced in the locale or particular context, such as nulmara, a thread-like precipitation that has become less common, and mist that is required for seed conservation. This is a different understanding of time from the abstract, predictable, reliable, accurately measured time of the Gregorian calendar. This is an understanding of time that follows rain of diurnal flux and changes in seasons and weather systems that has not been paid attention to in design of materials, of infrastructures and policy. But it is significant as it rains for more than half the year in this region. The life world of the Ghats is continually changing in minute and dramatic ways of operations of growth, movement and soakings. Here, time is embedded in the everyday ordinary in relation to movement. Although many farms and communities were unable to cope with the devastation of the floods and landslides of 2018 and 19, there were others who, whose creative practice passed down from generations worked with rain, precipitation, inundation, and the changing atmosphere and earth. These practices included conservation of diverse seeds, working with the slopes between low and high grounds to create nurseries and transplantings, using medicinal concoctions of wild herbs to enrich the soils and saplings, and planting fruit trees amidst paddy fields that attracted particular birds whose droppings strengthened roots. Recorded everyday practices of engaged understanding of this seeping world included curing seeds in misty conditions, thatching shelters made of mud, plastering porous walls with a mix of grass, mud, cow dung, and ash, planting diverse crops along slopes, also ensure diversity of soils, some that do not wash away easily. And that some varieties of paddy, even after a deluge, may not be consumable by humans, but is so, is so for other creatures who then fertilize the earth and citing home in a way to privilege soakings across dwelling practices, as well as understanding decay as material change. In this way, these small farms transform seasonally each ground of different each a ground of different rhythms synchronized with changing conditions from bearing produce to laying fallow of rhythms of movements and pauses of air and, and material and soil. It is possible that the inhabitants of Weinard and other parts of the Ghats are creative practitioners, continually constructing a dynamic landscape matrix of multiple grounds and practices that nurture and sustain these practices 
not just for humans, but including the participation of other sentient beings, as well as diverse materials. This terrain is a complex shifting matrix, oscillating in between ever becoming and inhabiting particular places through practice time. How do these communities do this? How do they read a different world? And is it possible for us, the urban educated, formally educated dweller, to, at the very least, but partially convert into the sensitive, inclusive and responsive inhabitant? How do they know how and where and when to cite certain practices? When we ask these how questions, we seek a fundamental shift from problem identification, solutioning, or asking to asking why questions, which actually the how questions then seek a richer description of the world. Some believe indigenous people's knowledges are superstitious, not taking diverse forms of transmission into consideration. Their knowledge seems to lie in songs, material practices, myths, and performances. In Uttara Kannada, a community of Kumri Marathas who practiced Swidden cultivation until recently shared a fable with me of multiple intertwined fables anchored in rain and wetness of rain seasons, stars, times of precipitation, and what to cultivate, when and how. The stories apparently change over time and through generations incorporating the contemporary. I believe the colonial imaging and describing has reduced our understanding of complexities and need, and so therefore needs, we need a transdisciplinary approach and methods. Wetness and rain are inescapable in the ghats. These inhabitants are able to read change from being dwellers in the world, negotiating by walking, a fundamental movement to carry on with life. It's an ordinary everyday practice through a ground or milieu that is devoid of subjectivity. When we walk, how do we see and what do we see? By walking through a ground, ground is like an ecotone. We traverse through atmosphere and earth and encounter inhabitants and other goings on, rhythmically responding and shaping and moving with and through. This walking practice or practice of movement is one that holds other practices and goings on. Henry David Thoreau elaborates on walking as a way of wandering, of giving in to the practice of walking without thinking about it, but thinking through it. So to him, and perhaps to some of us, walking is not a way of getting lost, not in the manner that one is clueless about one's whereabouts, but in a manner to find one's way through the environment, being a creative practitioner in this every day. It is also about being immersed in the context and of a sensibility that acknowledges phenomena or, or, that are ephemeral, never to occur again in the same way. Tim Ingold further explores walking as being a material practice that involves paying attention to or demonstrating care through practice. This being in a weather world is possibly an existence to do and carry out practices, operations, activities, and other makings. This is also about the ordinary rather than the exotic. Practices such as walking, thatching, sighting, searching for water, foraging, harvesting, mending fishing nets, peeling and shelling ardiki, finding certain medicinal plants, and so on. This is an act of world making, actually. It is not just one practice nor space that defines the makings of the world, but a whole array of practices, skills, and movements. This multiplicity is an entanglement of doings. In Vailnad, it manifests and is held in material transformations. Paddy that is grown is harvested, then thrashed, and then the grasses are cured, becoming thatching for roofs, and then they de decay into the fields, becoming earth, all corresponding with conditions of wetness with time, because each, each of these practices occur at a cer certain moment of the rain calendar. These communities dwell in a threshold imagination following rain for daily life, each practice intertwined and interdependent with others. So how do we shift from drainage imagination to a threshold? How does this affect practices of design, environmental health, and planning? If we're now privileging wetness rather than resisting it, learning to work with changing patterns and drawing, and if drawing is fundamental to design, what kinds of lines do we draw now? Here are a number of speculations and thoughts that are in development. In design, it would displace the value given to a teleologically driven design agenda that a final output or product is predetermined and seemingly permanent. It would actually, we would actually be thinking about the kacha. It would transform our aesthetic values and ideas of permanence. And the emphasis would be more on process and practices rather than a final output that never changes. The kacha would be privileged and would need to hold meaning in a moment of transformation. 
So it may be that we are over-designing and not allowing that which is designed to adapt to change. It would also mean a highly mobile world continually shifting, transforming, and inhabiting. Sight can no longer be, the only, be only spatial, marked by boundary lines. However, the act of sighting is a practice that is relational to landscape, its horizons, and depths of temporalities. Material understandings would also change. The arts and crafts of working more with fluidities and transformations will become ever important. And thinking about found materials that are related to and emerging from place, a commonly found material in the Ghats, Plains, and West Coast is laterite. It is a material that is soft and mushy when beneath and unexposed. But once it is exposed to the atmosphere, it hardens. So hard that Francis Buchanan in 1801 described it as black rock. Known to be the first to identify and describe laterite as a material, Buchanan led the way for other company geologists who traveled with surveyors or with district administrators who recorded laterite extensively throughout the southern peninsula of India, such as Newbold and Boise. They intensely recorded the geology of India, separating materials from one another by representing them as layers in sectional drawings. This enabled us to imagine deep extraction of laterite, coal, iron ore, and other materials. In the past decades and today, extractions are rampant, some being illegal, and this dramatically changes the makeup of and transformation of materials that actually have qualities for soaking and holding water. This is one of the concerns in the Anthropocene. Since laterite holds water, it is actually a part of holding systems in the Ghats. For example, the surangas that are found across Kasargod and South Canada. Here I emphasize porosity as an important quality of material, of being able to get wet and are allowing waters to move through the material. This particular quality is even more fascinating in relation to the pandemic, at least it was to me. Um, and for this, I want to share an excerpt from the South Canada District Manual of the flute that came in 1890, brought by ship, as most illnesses appeared in this manner in colonial times. I found this just when the pandemic began, and speculations and conspiracy theories were around COVID-19, um, that it's a man-made virus and how the virus spreads through touch and breath. These included that the virus spreads through contact with surfaces like mica, plastic, glass, steel, where the virus can linger on for days, longer than on cardboard, wood, leaves, mud. It also spreads in enclosed spaces. What was interesting for me was to wonder about the world then and how it differs from now. Harold Stewart, who, who actually put this uh, district manual together, recalls the flu as having subsided during the monsoon. I emphasize this because it privileges a time that has not been considered when we design land-centric infrastructures that keep waters away. During the monsoon, the wettest time of the year when water is inescapable. How did this happen? It occurred to me that perhaps it was the porous nature of the region and subcontinent at that time, that the natural organic world was perhaps able to transform the flu from its then deadly nature to dissolve, dissipate, or transform it. At that time, there were no concrete, cement, or tar surfacing the roads, nor were there RCC buildings or large glass windows, no plastics, nor any other industrially produced materials that were water resistant or waterproof. Instead, they all had abilities to hold water. This directs our attention to materials and their qualities and processes. The world then was primarily made from mud, lime plaster, rock, organic debris, soils, processes of growth and decay, the humid atmosphere and its multiple forms of precipitation, other biota and the inhabitants that appropriated these for their daily lives. They may have all been players in this dilution of the flu. It is also the nature of dwellers in this wet world to largely inhabit the outdoors. Life used to happen outside the shelter, in the environment, while today we cocoon ourselves in enclosures attempting to protect ourselves from the ordinary realities of monsoonal India. Today, we struggle to understand the, the COVID-19 virus as we inhabit a world of fear dominated by concrete, glass, and metal designed to be permanent and impervious. It's no wonder that COVID was and continues to be more rampant in urban and metro areas, while the villages, less developed areas, having less impervious permanent land-centric infrastructures, see dramatically fewer cases, if any. As for planning, we need a watery approach, designing with atmosphere and terrain, non-linear holding systems and responsive, flexible, adaptive, ephemeral, porous infrastructures for new kinds of development based on collective values 
and community needs and livelihoods. The lines we draw can no longer divide land and water in order to manage it better. Rather, the lines we inscribe into the world are through the practices that we engage in of giving in to movement, weaving, negotiating that are real, that are real and physically appropriating this aqueous amphibious terrain. In Vailnad, communities depend on this non-linearity of holding systems. So simple in design that the site takes advantage of the natural slopes, soil, and conditions, and simple techniques of steps, buns, trenches, terraces, and small holding ponds or canies and, and wells, all made from mi a mix of mud and sand and materials that are found in place. These are methods that include rain and wetness, allowing water to soak and seep into the earth and hold in order to enrich the earth, vegetation, and edibles growing from it. Time here is not linear. It is, time here is not a linear metronomically measured element of the world, nor is it a measure of efficiency and productivity and permanence that we associate with the Gregorian calendar. It is held with rhythmic practices in the meshwork of movements. This is the temporal world of dwelling in the ghats. These practices or tasks are trajectories of movements and pauses. Walking being a meta practice and dwelling or home is always an, in an ecotone, a place of transformation and change. Time needs no measure as it can only be experienced through the active dwelling practices while these follow rain. Rather than looking and observing um, site features that privilege landscapes as objects within objects, it is necessary to think through the qualities of places by thinking and deeply exploring a threshold notion in context as each place demands a complex engagement as we encounter it, not to pre-plan um, in that sense. We need to dwell and correspond with the goings on of place, with the natural processes. This builds a sensitivity and sensibility to understand change, familiarizing again and again to know again and again through engaged ecologies. I wish to conclude with the impacts that this research has had in the area of policy design. Um, some of this documentation of particularly in Vailnad um, was done along with two master's students actually as part of a studio before the 2018 floods. The report we produced, which is available online, became relevant to the, distinct, to the district in terms of thinking about the region as a seeping and soaking environment. We also began to think about the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, as Wynard had a big push to promote them. What we found was that the SDGs do not relate to the situated and local understandings and language and practices and knowledges. Instead, it promotes more Western or non-Indian thought through the language of interventions and problem solving. As a response to this disconnect between the SDGs and ground realities, the students took this forward to their final capstone project and worked with communities in the Vaitri Panchayat of Wynard. One student designed new sustainable development goals from the ground for that community and including, included the concerns of the community. As it is impossible to separate one SDG from another in design and implementation, she devised clusters from community values and systems. The other student designed a new tool that may assist farmers and officials alike that included multiple dimensions of weather and time of the year, changing terrain and slopes, as well as what could be cultivated, how and when. Both their policy designs and tool designs included rain and wetness as base conditions and considered tactics of the communities, overflows and inundations as ordinary to the place, not as extraordinary events of a visiting rain, but a rain that is is actually an inhabitant. So I would like to just say that water is not just H2O. It is elemental and material. Water does not move linearly. It seeps, oozes, infiltrates, soaks, inundates, precipitates, rises, even defies gravity, moving non-linearly through materials, our bodies, and the atmosphere. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deepta, Dr. Satish, for that for that really enlightening talk and you know which covers such a vast gamut of issues concerning wetness and water but the temporal spatial the intellectual the ide you know the ideological intellectual material and so many different aspects which are 
which are linked with um, with wetness and in in and which is also very context specific, like you mentioned in you know in Vyanad itself, how it plays out and how it acts out in other uh, other regions of India may be very different. So this is uh, this is a very interesting uh, way of looking at land, water. Uh, habitation, uh, the conflicts that you mentioned about between nature and culture, and also about different types of livelihoods, right? Uh, and what are the conflicts that exist in, in terms of those livelihoods? I was just wondering, maybe we could just start with, uh, you know, this, this aspect of forestry, agriculture, and so many different things that have existed uh, and have, you know, probably grown over time or have become more rampant in many places. Also with the land-based infrastructure that you said, you know, comes also with these kind of practices becoming more and more common. Uh, I was just wondering if you could, could uh, you know, maybe throw some light on uh, the issue of livelihoods and you know, with and and how that sort of also uh, frames or conditions and you know these kind of design practices, uh, especially from your experience in Vinod. Yes, thank you, thank you, Dr. Danishri. Um, yeah, I think um, you know uh, if we just look at only Vinod specifically at this point, um, you know, it is actually, it, I mean, a large uh, a large percent of their land use um, is agriculture and forestry, almost all of it actually. Um, and so they are, and it's also one of, it's also known, um, and what is interesting to me is um, that Vailnad is actually the local name for it. Um, why not is sort of, uh, you know, an anglicized uh, name. And um, so these practices of, agri I mean, the kinds of cultivation are very diverse. There's a huge agrobiodiversity in Wynad. Um, and interestingly, um, you know, of course, apart from the banana plantations and rubber plantations and all these things that are sort of taking over um, in, in a more uh, sort of, I guess it's, more of the demand of the market that is sort of taking over certain of uh, certain landscapes and why not there are particular things that that are and continue to be local to why not which are different kinds of paddy different kinds of grains and rices that are grown um pepper um coffee and we know about these things because you know many of us have under, have sort of looked at the history of the region um, as being, you know, very important in the spice trade and things like that. Um, but what is interesting about um, Wynad is that there are, there are farmers that are conserving, um, you know, hundreds of varieties of old seeds and old varieties. Um, and so it's almost like the region is living in two different dimensions, one that, is, that serves the market and the other that is about a cultural uh, landscape that is trying to sort of sustain itself and sustain the knowledge. It's not about sustaining knowledge, it's really about the food that people eat and the way they live. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so forestry is also another topic that is really uh, contentious, especially in Wynald, because most of the forests that are there are teak plantations, which the British planted um, in the mid 1800s and late 1800s. And um, so it's so it's sort of a very conflicted area. They also have human animal conflicts. And these conflicts seem to be defined by, um, you know, uh, by uh, by the market, actually. Um, because the local local people don't see elephants as um, as a threat. Um, it's only when they are cultivating for the market because their yield gets less, um, and you know that suddenly their livelihood is at is at stake. Um, that they then say, "Oh my God, it's a conflict." But those who have you know very small farm holdings, which are about three to five acres, um, they usually cultivate only for themselves and their and their own uh, homes. And the only thing that they might take to market is pepper. Um, and things that are left over from their own consumption. So it's like, you know, there are, things, there are people who are uh, living for sustenance and there are people who are living for the market. So it's um, that itself, you know, they're, sometimes they're next to each other. And that also con constructs conflicts because there is, you know, uh, pesticide and all these other issues going on. Um, and so the farmers that, that, are, that have small holdings that are continuing old practices actually work with different kinds of rain. So when I was there once in mid-March, uh, one of the farmers was thatching his roof and I said, um, I said, you know, so how long will you take to, to re-thatch this whole thing? And he said, oh, I have to finish by this evening because it's going to rain. 
and it was morning you know so he knew it was going to rain he knew had to finish something so they plan and they have a sensibility to read the landscape to read change so that they can see they can understand when um the next you know thing is that they have to plan with in that sense so it's quite i mean it's this, it's a, it's a never ending process of discovering actually so yeah i hope yeah. that responds to your question <laughs> yeah yeah no i i know it's very complexly you know interwoven with each other so it's very difficult to say okay this is what leads to conflict or this is something that may not lead to conflict and you know especially in these contexts uh we have a few questions from the audience so i, I i've just got it in my private chat as well so this question i'm not sure who's it from but then the question is about the changing lifestyle and culture and development practices especially you know you see that in cities in particular the question relates to infrastructure demands and you know this whole culture of high rise buildings which is something that is being promoted uh, in urban settings in particular um and this is something that is also sort of building uh, you know this this culture of uh, more infrastructure building which is something that is more urban even in the western ghats which we are seeing how this is also leading to large scale destruction especially during the monsoon we we are seeing that in bangalore today for instance when you know the whole city is flooded with uh, or um, many many parts of the city are, are flooded with no access to water so uh, how, how do you think like you know these kind of practices i mean is there a possibility of reversal in many of these cases it's not even possible to like reverse those practices but even if you know uh, there are ways to sort of uh, build some as you mentioned resilience into these settings how how do you do that in in consonance with the climate uh, you know how the climate is changing and how it's also kind of affecting say public health and other sectors as well uh, simultaneously i know it's a difficult question but you know if you can uh, shed some light and your opinions on this yeah sure um yeah it is definitely a difficult question but it is something um to sort of i guess create in a design agenda around um and um so i think i think one of the issues is uh, as i mentioned in during when i when i was presenting um i mentioned that we tend to over design things um and uh, and i mean by that is that what i mean by that is that we're constantly designing things at a large scale um that you know that uh, we seem to want to plan for some future um that we think is going to happen or that we're predicting and planning for that future of like you know a population increase of a certain kind of economic um you know activities in the city um and we plan our infrastructures for that and uh, keeping that in mind but we also plan for correcting the issues that we're facing right now so it's always about problem solving and even the future ideas are about problems that we are encountering that we have to sort of um you know make sure that it doesn't happen but of course it happens right um so i think how can we think of um how can we think of not i don't want to say the city but let's say um you know uh, different kinds of habitations that are higher density um that can we think about working with with the land with the way the land is rather than flattening everything that's what we do when we do development we flatten the land and then we wonder um you know why is it flooding right um, <laughs> we've sort of tarred over everything and there's no place for water to go down and then we build drains and then the water is sort of drained off the road or whichever infrastructure it goes in into the drains and then it disappears and then we say there's no water um so we're actually taking water away from our own habitats by doing that um so how can we start to think about including it um even in an rcc home during the monsoon we all have wet patches on the wall so we cannot escape the wetness and that's what i want to highlight that um it is inescapable it is something that we need to work with we're constantly mending things when the monsoon so why is it that we can't design so that we don't have to mend all we have to do is care for something enough and so i think one is that we need to sort of think about a, re, a, a set of values that will drive uh, new designs um that work with water um and moving water per se not that it's still um i mean since you mentioned bangalore um one of the issues is you know uh we today it's flooding it's flooded so much that the power pump, the pumps um from the kaveri that pumps water up to the city have been you know are inundated and they're just fixing it today i think um and 
and we complain that there's no water in Bangalore, but we are constantly, um, you know, but there are, Bangalore is also known as the city of a thousand lakes. Um, actually, they're keres, which are tanks. Lakes are natural formations. So we're misnaming it. Um, and we have also, in this massive infrastructure agenda, we have, um, you know, taken these keres and turned them into lakes that are isolated from each other. In the original system, the keres were all connected and it was about a water sharing system. Um, and actually, uh, Dr. Dilip Dakuna and the late Anuradha Mathur have written this amazing book called Deccan Traverses that revealed the colonial past of how the t tanks used to be. And they were a nonlinear system. Um, and, uh, you know, they've actually even suggested, um, it came in the newspaper a few years ago, they even made suggestions to the government of what the tactics could be. Um, and how to actually address these issues that, you know, can we have more bore wells? Can we clean up the channels? What we have, the channels that we used to connect the keres have been turned into drains. And so it's now full of trash when it used to actually uh, move clean water or waters that would be cleaned in that process of movement. And so I think it is about thinking about um, infrastructures that are flexible, that are um, that are adaptable, the infrastructure itself. Um, and so maybe they're semi pakka, semi kacha. I mean, we can't make everything kacha, um, but maybe we can, I mean, that's what we're here to do. We, have, you know, we can design new things. So why can't we think beyond um, beyond the the dominant narrative really, which is sort of, which is which is about leaving water out because surveyors, don't survey during the monsoon. They only survey when it's dry. And so what is recorded as data is devoid of water. So that's also another agenda to start doing new kinds of surveys. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that, uh, for, you know, those insights, because it's, it's so important to even think about these issues in a different way. Like you mentioned, transform the way we think about these issues, which is something that we lack and we constantly look at correcting corrective measures or problem solving ways, even, you know, even global uh, level policy making tends to go by, uh, you know, this frame of working with uh, issues. Um, so there's another question uh, about, um, yeah, another question from the audience. This is about uh, the fact that, you know, uh, chemical waste, antibiotic seepage, uh, which is something that which is also affecting groundwater quality, for instance, uh, from a design perspective, uh, what are the ways in which some of these uh, issues can be tackled? Um, and, and in fact, something that is connected to it is also about the use, for instance, of fertilizers, chemicals and all these, uh, you know, kind of uh, technologies or materials in that sense, which we use in agriculture, which also tends to, uh, you know, uh, have impact on water in particular. Um, and in that sense, you mentioned some, you know, you mentioned a lot about actually indigenous uh, uh, or traditional knowledge around water systems and the the fact that many communities have traditionally practiced regenerative and not, you know, not just organic, but regenerative farming and several other practices have existed for a long time. But that, you know, those practices are not being sustained uh you know with maybe you know uh with maybe the next generation not really interested in this or maybe you know also like the the current generation being kind of uh fueled more by more and more productive agricultural or whatever like you know so so i was just thinking, uh, so the question is more about you know how 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 do these uh, issues also uh i mean what are the what are the solutions to it from a design perspective I mean, the groundwater quality as well as the agricultural practices that are there. So these are the two questions. Yeah. Wow. Um, I don't know if I can answer the one about chemical waste, but I think I think it is an important thing to think about because there is so much of industrial waste. Um, I think maybe it's about, um, and then this is, you know, I have no idea, but maybe we need to think about first um, privileging um, you know, the fact that we are actually that, you know, maybe there is no drain, maybe there is no place to put waste. I mean, actually, in any Indian language, if you think the word, the word for waste that we use very colloquially is not really waste. It's usually something, it's about some residual thing, you know, like kachra or something is a residue of something that gets put out into the earth in the world. So waste is not a, 
a cultural notion that we have in India. It is a new idea that has been introduced to us. Um, and so, um, so of course, we can go into a theoretical, philosophical understanding of it. But practically speaking, I think we need to sort of think about really come down hard on these industries that are putting out the waste. Um, you know, there are lots of environmental laws um, that actually help to control this kind of uh, this kind of production. Um, and I think um, it's not just the industries. Uh, we put out waste out of our houses every day. Um, I think if we can start to be a little bit more conscious of how what we are buying, in what form we're buying it, um, and you know, is there an alternative? There are plenty of alternatives out there today. Um, you know, design has been uh, not just design, but all kinds of uh, new entities and new enterprises have come out with alternatives. So I think we need to sort of be a little bit more proactive in sort of uh, you know moving our lifestyles to those kind of things. Um, and uh, that would be my uninformed. Uh, response um, on the fertilizers and the issues of uh, the youth and livelihoods and the you know the agricultural. I think you know one of the one of the um, the uh, the things about capitalism is that the city is is the driver of capitalism. We see the city as the place of opportunity, and we don't see the village or the farm as an opportunity. And I think we need to really think about changing aspirational values. Um, you know, why is, I mean, I would like to farm, you know? I mean, so, you know, and there are other people who are city dwellers who want to get away from the city and become farmers, and there are people who are doing that. So it's not just about, you know, people. So can we, and even for the farmers who hold this knowledge for generations, their children are going away into the city. How can we enable them to see the value of their own home? Um, and it's not to not say that they can't go to the city, but to let them see the values of both. Um, so that is really about aspirations, I think, more than um, more than a design agenda and solution, because um, because we don't necessarily want to lose that knowledge. We want to sort of find ways, and also that we can't go back into a past knowledge. We need to keep moving forward into um, because we can never go to a past. How can we constantly reappropriate? Because even the local communities and indigenous communities are reappropriating their own knowledge actually to move with the times. So, for example, that community that I spoke about, the Kumri Marathas in Uttar Kannada, they actually used to cultivate ragi. So the rag word ragi was in that fable. And now the word is paddy for paddy, you know, because they've changed their, but the process, you know, and so the rain story that, it, that is still the rain story for that particular crop. Um, so, um, so it's not that they're replacing rain in a re-understanding of time, but they're actually just adapting within a framework that they already have. Um, so it's also about being adaptive and creative and being more sensitive really to, to, uh, to change in the environment. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question, if that's okay. So, uh, uh, and this is from me. Uh, so, uh, you know, you mentioned resilience uh, uh, and resilient in 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 many ways, and and this is something that I have also tried to understand. What does resilience mean in that sense? You know, because. Uh, because there are, you know, especially in global, uh, international level policy making around climate change and other such uh, issues, there's usually a tendency to have a very new liberal thinking around resilience and, you know, markets can offer the solutions and, you know, um, not, you know, many, many forms of knowledge not being integrated. Uh, and also the fact that resilience can also mean that you leave the communities be, but, you know, you just leave communities to be, you know, fend for themselves uh, and not really taking care of the structural kind of problems that uh, that that the state or corporate or other 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 uh, players or actors might have acted upon uh, and, you know, might have created in the first place. So I was just I, I was just wondering like, when you say resilience and also something, you know, increasingly as we look at like, you know, planetary level issues. Uh, which is not just restricted to the local level, but it's also something that is connected to the global, uh, you know, food uh, uh, markets or the entire supply chains, everything which also affects the local communities. So in that sense, how how, how do you really, really think about, you know, designing just that, that framework itself? I, I, I was just curious to understand that. Yeah. Wow, that's loaded. 
um, but I think you know it's uh, I think it's something I guess perhaps even for a longer conversation later. But I um, what I'd like to how I'd like to respond to it is actually um, I think that um, what would be uh, beneficial I think or to think about resilience in this manner is that to be honest. Um, you and I or others as individuals, we cannot change the world um, in that sense. Um, you know, there are multiple cultures just around us physically, let alone different countries and the politics of each and the cultures of each and the practices of each and all of that. Um, so I feel that, um, that it's really important to engage um, in a local manner. Um, and so I guess this is also drawing from a way that I've... Uh, you know, uh, immersed myself also in places to engage in them because it requires a certain immersion that I feel you can change a, change things in a small way, but change is not necessarily about putting out a designed uh, entity or an infrastructure out there only. It is also about initiating ideas, initiating thought, initiating something that can grow. So in that sense, um, you know, so if we think about resilience in that way, um, that we give value to a resilient practice, let's say, or an adaptive practice in the socio-ecological relationship that we've seen that is really, really exciting because they're able to fend for themselves, but yes, they do also depend on the market and they depend on rain and they're facing climate change issues. Um, but how do we care for that particular place and the processes of that place? Um, how do we demonstrate that there is care involved in it? Um, so I feel that resilience has, I think we need to also rethink what resilience is, that it's not this, um, you know, this, in, this uh, infinity loop that people draw, because that's a closed system. It is actually, it should be something that is an open system that keeps changing and, be, and is dynamic continually. Um, so that, you know, uh, so that it includes change that is going on, but it's also sort of think, so we're also thinking about a system um, that is constantly responding to what is going on, that it's not designing what, what is going on in that sense. But can we think of resilience as ways of moving with things that are going on around us? Um, as responsive, as participative, um, as inclusive in that sense. Um, you know, it's like simple, simple, simple thing is like when we think about our own health, our own body's health, right? Um, you know, we get the, we get a cold and our body, first time we get a cold, we're probably a baby and our body suddenly realizes, oh, here is an infection that I need to think about and deal with. And the body responds in a certain way and the next time it recognizes this thing and it does its thing. Right? You catch a cold, your body knows how to sort of recover from it in some manner. It takes a few days, a week sometimes, if you are eating properly and drinking enough fluids. So there's a way in which the body responds and adapts. Um, and uh, so we can even think of our how our body functions and think about the world in that sense or just our environment in that sense. And is it responsive to what is going on in that sense? So I feel resilience is not a mathematical construction. It is not about, not just, about, that comes later. Um, first, we need to sort of set a set, think about a set of values. Um, also, it has to be place-based, that is no single formula for it. Um, and so, yeah, so I really think that contextual understanding is really, really important. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you so much.